Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. What I would say is, on this, children were murdered. They were targeted. It's quite clear they were targeted. Uh-huh. Uh, not only that, you know, it's if we're discussing the numbers of babies beheaded, I think we've kind of lost the plot. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This episode is presented by Matt Fulton and produced by Chris Carr. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Secrets and Spies. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Philip Smythe. Philip was a SORA fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy from 2018 to 2021 and has researched Shia Islamist militarism at the University of Maryland. For over a decade, he's been one of the leading researchers on Iranian-backed terrorist organizations such as Hamas, Lebanese Hezbollah, and other affiliated groups throughout Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Persian Gulf. Philip joins me to discuss the unfolding Israel-Hamas war, what he's personally witnessed in covering the October 7th terrorist attack in southern Israel, the question of Iran's involvement, and whether Hezbollah will more directly enter the war. I'd also like to add a quick content warning. This episode contains some graphic descriptions of the atrocities Hamas committed against Israeli civilians. These details are not included to be sensational, but because I believe it's important to be clear about the horrific nature of this attack and for listeners to hear these details from a subject matter expert who has seen evidence of it firsthand. However, I wanted to make you aware of this before we begin. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. All right, Philip Smythe, welcome to Secrets and Spies, buddy. It's good to have you here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for actually having me. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking, uh, short of getting uh, Saeed Hassan Nasrallah or maybe the ghost of Qasem Soleimani, I don't think there's anyone that I could get better for this topic. Well, I, it, it's a lonely place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's 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 get into it here. Um, so before we sort of get into the details of the attack and Iran's involvement and all that kind of stuff, just for the benefit of listeners, could you tell us uh, briefly about you, your research, how you know what you know? OK. Um, I mean, I've been doing uh, studying Iranian proxy groups uh, for almost, geez, I'm now I'm counting how old I am, uh, almost 15 years <laughs> um, lived in Lebanon, lived in the region uh, for for quite a while, um, but I very quickly became uh, quite obsessed with one aspect of uh, Iran's kind of proxy network. And we always hear this kind of like, what is Iran's proxy network? I mean, it's a vast array of different forces. Uh, some of them are not uh, ideologically similar to the theocratic practices in Iran. Um, and yes, Iran is a, a Shia, it, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran is a Shia Islamist state, um, but they do have compunctions to uh, ideological ones uh, to kind of rule the Middle East. So, you know, exactly going back to, okay, well, what exactly is a, is a proxy? Like, what do you mean? Um, these are forces that sometimes the Iranians have actually kind of created out of whole cloth to use as uh, terrorist groups, as militias, you know, kind of more like a... Uh, kind of a regular kind of army in some in some senses. Um, there are groups that can kind of apply pressure to other regional and international foes. Um, but th they're pretty complex, but oddly formulaic all at the same time um, when it comes to how Iran executes its foreign policy. And for Iran, you know, a lot of people would talk about how their nuclear weapon uh, the the request to get a nuclear weapon is actually going to be kind of the really the biggest thing. And uh, what I would say is Iran's best capabilities right now for kind of reaching out and touching someone are using these proxy networks. And um, and going back to who I am, I mean, I've, I've 
because I've been working on this for 15 years. Um, I was a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I worked at the University of Maryland. Um, I was at the Atlantic Council. I've I've written quite a bit about it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, when you're in DC, there's a million little titles and things that go along with things. But yeah. uh, frankly, um, you know, it's been a, kind of an odd passion project for me because there was not, there wasn't really a lot of attention that was placed on them for quite some time. And I would even argue even right up until now, um, because it is like, once you kind of dive into that realm of, of studying them, it's, it's whole, this whole other level of kind of esoteric because, you know, most people, they hear about an Islamist group, they think ISIS or they think Al Qaeda. Um, they don't necessarily think of, you know, Iran, despite Iran, uh, essentially running what amount to jihadist groups uh, since the creation of the Islamic Republic in 1979. Um, so, I mean, this has been kind of a, a very, very long thing that the Iranians have been doing. Um, and I mean, we can actually see, I mean, I don't know if you want me to go into this, but you can actually see kind of the after effects in the region right now of what the proxy network really is. And uh, first place that I would, I would say to look is uh, Syria. Syria is probably the the one example that will stick out for people who have you know a memory greater than a goldfish, um, you know for something that just kind of happened recently. And for recently, I mean this has been going on from 2011 uh, until the current the present day. Um, and what happened was Iran essentially engineered a a, a Shiite jihad uh, to bolster their their kind of regional ally, who's Bashar al-Assad, who rules Syria. Um, and what they did was they shipped in tens of thousands of uh, Shia militiamen. And when I say Shia militiamen, it's kind of interesting because I use it sometimes interchangeably with, you know, a Shia jihadist in sometimes. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of these guys are completely ideologically loyal to what the Iranians want, meaning the Iranians follow a kind of this ideological path of wilayat al absolute wilayat al uh, That's kind of what's what the, the ideological thinking is called. Um, but a lot of these guys could be like conscri conscripts, recruits. But anyway, uh, Iran uh, put all these guys in Syria and essentially won the country back with the the loving assistance of a ton of Russian air power um, over the course of 2013 uh, till about 2018. And by the way, these forces are still in Syria and they still dominate large and very important uh, geostrategic chunks of the country. Uh, and have really kind of transformed the country in a totally different way than even had, you know, Bashar al-Assad just won himself. Uh, so that's kind of a recent thing. But the other thing is, you know, we're currently talking about, about Gaza and what's going on there. And that doesn't yep. really comport with the whole kind of Shia jihadist or Shia Islamist or, or Shia militia kind of uh, bit of this. And I think we have to look at Iran. Uh, it has not just kind of transnational goals and larger ideological goals, but but one of those kind of big pieces of it is Iran views itself as kind of the leader. They should be the leader of the Islamic world. You know, full stop. Um, yes, they place- you know, The regional hegemon. Yes. I mean, a re regional hegemon, but not just yeah. that though. I mean, religiously speaking, which is kind of important with how they look at it, you know, Shiism kind of takes on a, a kind of higher value in their system, obviously. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't reach out to and or use a lot of different other groups. And when I say that, um, in Gaza right now, you may have noticed that a number of the groups and these Palestinian groups, all of them, I should say, uh, are, are you know Sunni in kind of their construction and in, in kind of their membership profile. Um, but then you have this other thing where you know some of them are also you know if you're, you're thinking back to the 60s and 70s, um, you know you have groups like the DFLP, uh, meaning the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. You have the Popular Front for the Liberation yeah. of Palestine, and these are kind of Marx. These are essentially Marxist groups, or at least you know kind of communist adjacent groups. Um, and it's interesting because you know Iran has also taken them under its wing because again there's there's a level of pragmatism to this. Um, when they come to approaching their foes, whether they're in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Iraq, Syria, or Israel right now. Um, so 
I mean, that's again, they they are part of that part of that proxy network. And I think, you know, a lot of people who look at kind of their more loyal proxies like Lebanese Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah is like the crown jewel for, you know, Iran's proxy network and and really how they they kind of run the show. Yeah. Uh, but then you look at some of these other groups and you go, wait, wait a second. How, how are they dealing with a group that just actually had problems with Shia or a group that's essentially atheistic? Um, and, you know, sometimes it just comes down to we got the cash and we also uh have the ability to guide you and give you some sense of uh, place in the region. And P.S. We're the ones who are going to guarantee it. Is it is it good to say that all of these groups maybe overcome their ideological differences and their kind of conflicting histories and stuff by they're they're unified by a common goal? Well, sometimes yes. I mean, I, I mean, in this case, like in Gaza, they're unified by militarism. They're unified by you know a desire to uh, destroy the Jewish state. Um, you know, a mm. lot of anti-Americanism there, obviously. Um, but, you know, Iran is still, and, and you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting kind of reading some of the news on this where someone will, someone will say, well, you know, Iran did, you know, they finance them, you know, like full stop. Okay, that, that's no big deal. But the financial part of this is a huge element to it because a lot of these groups uh, would not really be you know, existing as they are now, or even able to pull off a lot of their more militant uh, types of behavior without that Iranian financing. And the Iranians have also used said financing to keep these guys in line too. Um, so, I mean, you, you you have pieces like that, but yes, they are unified by a common goal. And for Iran, one of those common goals is, you know, the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, and they tend to kind of orient all of their proxies in that in that direction. Well, thank you for that. So I just uh, want to make a note here, something that I think sets you apart of a lot of other researchers in this space in DC, and that you're not just you aren't just reading Twitter and a bunch of think tank reports. You, you're an Arabic speaker. You're I don't know how much detail you want to go into this, but you're sort of inside the internal channels that these groups use. Correct. Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of it's like, there's a joke uh, in 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 circles around here that it, you know it's all just fancy googling. That's what it used to be called uh, back in the day when people didn't know what social mm -hmm. media was. It, it's a little bit more than that. I mean, there there's there's internal and then there's internal and there's stuff that you can monitor. Sometimes there's stuff that you can find that technically is open source, but I can promise you, if you didn't know exactly what to look for, you would never find it uh, because it's geared at a very specific uh, type of uh, person that's out there. Um, and I mean, again, I mean, I, I talk to Shia militia commanders. I talk to Shia militia members. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of these guys. I mean, I know a lot of other, you know, proxy group members. Uh, you know, I, we can say luckily or unluckily, um, the internet has gi given us some yeah. dexterity in terms of how we can reach out to and talk to people. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I've you know, traveled in the region a lot and it's, uh, it, it's intriguing uh, to how kind of easy it is sometimes to just kind of re you know reach out to somebody and say hey do you mind if I talk to you, um, so I mean I I, I try to build and yeah. maintain connections like that and I also uh, try to uh, religiously read what they are putting out and what's interesting is you kind of you get to a tempo where you you kind of know what to expect you know what to not expect. And uh, you can derive a lot from it. It's 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 less Kremlinology, um, and sometimes you kind of have to uh, look at it in a more interesting way. I don't know how to really explain it. Um, you know, there are certain patterns, and I was I was mentioning how formulaic you know some of these groups can be in terms of construction and their actions and their, their statements and stuff like that. Um, but of course, there's a lot under that surface. And when you're able to kind of put it all together, uh, certain trend lines may start to appear. And you know, I can give you the example of Syria. Um, one of the things that I did when I was covering a lot of what was going on there from the Shia militias, um, I mean, I am I am a, I am a pretty strong listener to, uh, to uh, a lot of jihadi music. And this will sound pretty crazy when I say it. Mm -hmm. um, the Nasheeds. Hey, the Nasheeds are, are, are my game. I mean, I I, I tend to enjoy it. Be they got some bangers. <laughs> they they certainly do. Uh, <laughs> um, I, what I would say though, what I would say though, on top of that is um, a lot of these songs that have come out, and and again, I, you know, I a lot of these things that have come out often will send signals in there. 
Uh, and again, it sounds crazy, but I do recall in 2012, there was a song that came out that was called Ya Zainab, and it was written by a, a guy named Ali Muali, who was later killed fighting for Muqtada Sadr's forces in Iraq. This is like many years down the line. But that song was actually used as a recruitment call in Syria. Like there, there are these little things, like you'd never know to look for it. Like, oh, this song, yeah, Zainab. Oh, I think there's a shrine in Damascus that's called, you know, Saida Zainab. <laughs> you know, maybe there's a connection. Well, there most certainly was a connection. You know, you even look at, you know, the company, the production company that was putting it on. Hmm, some interesting links to some Iranian proxies there. Why is this being re edited and used in this, 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 and this? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of working pieces here to really analyze them. And I mean, I, I tend to look outside the box on a lot of this stuff because, um, you know, unfortunately, and I would say this is one of the, the unfortunate pieces of academia, academia often, um, structures you to look at a problem set in a very specific way. And then at times you'll get people who come out of that setting who will, who will say, you know, um, oh, how does it look in reality? Yes, but does it work in theory? You know, <laughs> why isn't it working in theory? We should look at yeah. it that way. You know, it's, um, you know, I, I, I tend to just kind of look at a lot of odd little pieces and then also a lot of normal pieces like open source stuff. And I, you know, it's, it's, there has to be kind of a full compendium to it. And I, I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of trying to put all those pieces together and get the best picture that I can and really just work on not just conf uh, not just confirming that it's good stuff, uh, but also kind of using it to confirm larger trends. Thank you for that. So I, I would like to talk a bit about the, um, the attack in southern Israel on the 7th of this month. As I said on the on the last episode here on the on the podcast, I told listeners I was in D.C. last week, met up with you for a bit, um, and you seem pretty. Well, you didn't seem you were pretty disturbed by what you had seen in in your coverage of the attack. Stuff that at the time that you shared with me wasn't so much in the media to the extent that it is now. Um, if you're up for it, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about what you saw inside those internal jihadi channels discussing this attack, what they were sharing amongst themselves. I think that's important for people to hear it firsthand from someone who saw it. Okay. Well, I mean, some of it was actually live cast too. Um, you know, I have to have to mm -hmm. mention that. There's also little things that will go up here and there that are in more private groups, uh, you know, particularly in social media setups, like everything from Telegram uh, to a few other messaging apps that were out there. Um, but what I would say, and I, th I think I did say this to you, uh, it was unbelievable amounts of brutality and, you know, having worked on yeah. the Islamic state and having worked on, uh, Iran's Shia militias when they were fighting the Islamic state, uh, a little bit more extensively, uh, in Iraq. And I think we became used to, uh, real brutality almost in a cartoonish fashion. Uh, and I, I, I say that not to, not to say like, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, is is a cartoonish, uh, is, a, is just kind of a cartoon. Um, but, you know, that kind of brutality, um, I think it, it hit a chord with a lot of Americans um, with watching what was happening. And this yeah. was a whole different level of kind of ultra, just ultra violence. Um, and how it was coming out, I mean, again, we can, we can blame modern technology for this, advances in modern technology. But there is also a clear calculation to a lot of uh, the material going out. I mean, if you look at um, uh, like South First Responders, which is an, it's an Israeli page, and they are putting up uh, a lot of material uh, that was captured from Hamas GoPros and from security camera footage. I mean, you're already seeing levels of brutality there. Um, but what I would say is, you know, a lot of this, the other material that was going out um, was pretty horrific. A lot of, you know, and it's a lot of the uh, stuff that I had seen, it's interesting because it's, some of it's uh, now become public in other places. And it's kind of interesting how it's this kind of drip, drip, drip right. of just, just absolute horror, um, one after another. And I, again, I, you know, I tend to have, I, I tend to take issues sometimes, like when you're, you're watching TV or something and, and people talk about the absolute horror, and it almost sounds like it's a canned line. But I, when I say that it was really overpowering, um, I've seen a ton of stuff. I have, I have yeah. hard drive after hard drive filled with everything from beheadings, bodies being burned, um, people being strung up on, elect on electrical pylons from, uh, you know, in Iraq and in Syria. Um, you know, a lot of things that are, are 
quite terrible to watch. And this kind of stuff was, and again, I mean, you, I, I think in part the horror created was also this kind of realization that, you know, you look at the houses and stuff that they're going into, uh, and they appear to be pretty, you know, like, like humdrum, a middle-class kind of house that you'd find in a normal American neighborhood. Um, and so it kind of hits, you know, I'll be honest here, it hits a little bit harder uh, in, in many ways because of that too, not just the ultra violence. Um, and so a lot of these things kind mm-hmm. of combined into a really, really nasty picture. Um, but there is just a lot of, of really, really bad stuff. And yeah, it's the, the other thing is there are other, there, there are other open source researchers that are out there who are also, I, I mean, I know that they're seeing a lot of this and I've you know, talked to a lot of them. Um, and it's interesting to me where, you know, some of this stuff, was then gleefully promoted. And, you know, I, I find it interesting because, you know, there's this attitude uh, in a lot of sectors in the West of, you know, well, how could they do such a thing and why would they post that? And like, this is like literally only a couple of years after ISIS uh, doing their things. And again, I, I, I don't want to fall into uh, a certain narrative trap of just comparing it to, let's say, the Islamic State. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, you see ultra violence like this and other people are seeing it and it and it shouldn't shock anyone that it's coming out in a fashion where it's almost it's almost like a commodity being shot out there you know what i'm getting at um it, it yeah. it's the well you know they they have i was looking you know you look at hamas you look at pij palestinian islamic jihad um and they have great strategic comms. They do. You can't. You can't deny it. It was, you know, in part set up with a lot of Iranian aid. Um, you look at groups like the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP, uh, who've improved those skills. And then you look at what they're kind of putting up and what they're processing out on it. Um, and I, it's it's an odd juxtaposition, I think, for a lot of people who are either not exposed to it or have forgotten uh, how different terrorist organizations and how different militia groups work. And I, I think I, I, I truly think that that in part kind of adds to this kind of kind of terrible goriness and just terrible kind of of, of appearance to it. Um, now, whether that's by design, I mean, we can have arguments over that. But um, a lot of the stuff that was going up there uh, was uh, just not just not fit for human consumption. I want to ask you a direct question here in this, because I think it's important for people to hear this directly from a subject matter expert in in the space. And I'm going to ask this because there's been a lot of sort of false equivalencies and kind of conspiracy theories brewing up among some activists on the left and everything who say that these sort of details first came from um, IDF officers or Israeli journalists or something and then sort of got laundered through Western media and therefore its credibility is not entirely to be believed. That's what they're saying, okay? You, You told me about this before it was sort of widely reported in the press. Did you see, have you seen babies being beheaded in in this attack? Brutality that was targeted at children. You don't actually need to be a specialist researcher to find it because Hamas and PIJ are putting it up. And you know, it, it, we can we can right. go through you know I I find this I find it really interesting. It's it's kind of a red herring on this with, with the 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 beheading issue. It, it's quite clear we've had now confirmation after confirmation after confirmation that it happened. But, you know, I keep running into this issue of, you know, is it for like the issue for a lot of people was, was it 40 babies or just one? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's kind of a weird. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't yeah. matter. But, you know, there's other there are other incidents of just, again, extreme brutality when it came to beheading or or or. Uh, desecrating a corpse or doing a lot of other really horrific things. And yeah. we're also talking about, you know, firing into children's rooms and killing them and, you know, kind of understanding that, well, that might be a child there. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I, again, I, I, I'm having, I'm, I'm having to like choke myself down. What I would say is on this children were murdered they were targeted it's quite clear they were targeted uh-huh. uh not only that you know it's if we're discussing the numbers of babies beheaded i think we've kind of lost the plot 
if you you get where I'm going. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think I don't think we need to dwell on it any more than that. I I brought it up because before it gets sort of thrown down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, I think it's important for people to hear clearly the reality of what happened here. So thank you for that. Going back to to the scope and the scale of this attack, I mean, like we've talked about, you've consulted on on my writings for for a while, and I think if I came to you and said I have this idea that Hamas is going to go over the wire and execute the largest mass slaughter of Jewish civilians since 1945, and the Iranians wouldn't have known about it, you would have told me, no, Matt, that's just not at all how it works, right? So this question of Iranian involvement. U.S. intelligence, at least publicly, has said they're not really sure that they believe Iran was surprised. There's other sort of reporting out there that they were involved in varying level of varying levels of degrees. I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit about your your thoughts on that. Is it possible that Hamas executed this attack without the Iranians knowing about it? Uh, I, no. Again, I, and I, I said this in an interview. 100%, the Iranians knew what was going to happen. However, I think that they were met with what's, you know, what's called in some circles, with it's called catastrophic success, um, that uh-huh. there's a strong possibility that, you know, it, I'm not saying that they wouldn't want this to, you know, to, to happen. But again, you now have to respond in a certain way and handle the problem set in a, in a certain way that you've just helped create. Um, but again, the Iranians for quite a while were trying to build up uh, these groups that they could pull off attacks like this. And, you know, I, I'm not going to say, you know, I, I think there are some people out there who want to say that there's actually no autonomy in any of Iran's proxy groups, and that's not really how it works. And there's different levels of control that the Iranians can really push on an organization. Uh, but quite clearly, they were pushing all of these groups towards more militancy. Um, they were pushing them to, you know, learn and and perfect uh, new kind of tactics in the trade. Um, a lot of new weapon systems were brought in. Uh, the Iranians have supplied them with a ton of weaponry. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. You know, they they spent a lot of time smuggling in uh, a ton of stuff. But then it's not even just the smuggling it in. I mean, you look at kind of the plans on how do you, how is it if you're in Gaza, you're going to put together. Uh, a series of kind of unguided rockets and, uh, you know, a lot of other weapon systems. Well, it, it, they're getting the blueprints. Mm-hmm. They're also getting models shipped in from the Iranians so that they can be a little bit more self-sufficient. And that's, again, it's all part of the Iranian MO. And it's not the first time they've done this. Hell, they did this in Iraq. They did it with groups like uh, one of the Shia militias, which uh, some people may remember from the Iraq war uh, with EFPs and uh, explosively formed penetrators and other stuff was Asayab Ahl al Haq. And the uh, example I'm giving here is uh, Asayab Ahl al Haq doesn't need to come out and say that what's clearly an Iranian rocket design is actually their rocket design and they designed it. And yet they did it anyway because the Iranians are allowing them to do that to not just kind of create a sense that, oh, but you know they have a lot of autonomy and independence and look they their own ingenuity came up with this design uh but in another way to also kind of lessen the burden from the Iranians when they do actually have to ship more stuff over to them hey these guys now have a new capability and when you're in Gaza which right. is not you know like Iraq which uh which directly borders Iran and they can ship a lot of stuff in um you have to imagine that that also has a different kind of uh, add-on effect when it comes to uh when it comes to kind of building up a group and their capabilities. Um, But if you were to come to me and say, hey, Philip, uh, you know, I don't think the Iranians had anything to do with this. I would say either you are crazy, you are stupid, or you're a liar. Uh, And there's there's really no, you know, there's no other explanation if you were being dead serious to say like, no, no, they they just did this all on their own. They executed it all all on their own. No, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, I'm I'm of the opinion that the Iranians... um, may have bitten off more than they can chew. And we can see that with the levels of brinksmanship that are going on right now. Um, However, it's not necessarily that they're sitting there and going, oh, you know, I can't believe Hamas acted this way. You know, and I'll I'll give you an an exact kind of thinking, uh, kind of my thinking on this uh, to explain where I'm going with it. Um, Hamas did not act alone. And I think there's been this mischaracterization because it's much easier to say that that largest faction there uh, was really doing, you know, all the heavy lifting and OPS, you know, pal- the, the other Palestinians are just kind of following along. 
we're talking about every single faction that the Iranians have for what, at the very least, the past 10 years uh, uh, have been financing, they have been training, they have been having meetings with them in Beirut, um, they have been doing a number of different things with these groups and really trying to cultivate them. And now all of a sudden, after, you know, a number of years, these guys have uh, better capabilities, better weaponry, and oh, somehow they're operating in perfect conjunction with another Hamas plan that was in the in the works for at least two years. Um, you right. know, it, it just that's just not how the cookie crumbles. Um, it, you know, these guys, you know, clearly there was a lot of a lot of coordination, and to have a lot of that coordination, and again, I'm not saying it's outside the capabilities of Palestinian groups to coordinate or to get stuff done, uh, but to launch an operation like this and really have all of those moving pieces working so efficiently with the weaponry, with the financing, and everything else that goes along with it, the political support, um, that I mean, it, it really does spell you know, state backing, and it really does say how much the Iranians have done for them. So rather than just the broad levels of coordination and support that these groups receive from Iran, do you believe that the Iranians directly ordered this attack? Uh, this is the other part of this that I would get at. Do I think the Iranians wanted the attack and may have ordered it as a possibility to do? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and again, I mean, I... My thinking on this, this is just, and I, I occasionally will tweet about it or I'm writing a few articles about it right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I get the impression based on how Iran has executed these things before, they had a lot of internal pressure in Iran. There was a lot of external pressure, even within their own proxy networks post uh, uh, death of Qasem Soleimani um, and uh, Abu Mahdi al Muhandis uh, is kind of uh, close aide and, and a big commander in Iraq. Um, so there's yes. a lot of management issues that were going on there. You have a lot of issues with Lebanese Hezbollah. I'm not saying they're all negative, but Lebanese Hezbollah is doing a hell of a lot of heavy lifting uh, in Syria still to this day. And they're also trying to build up a new front against the Israelis, not just in Lebanon and rebuild capabilities and also integrate new capabilities. Uh, but they were trying to open up the Golan Heights. Um, and they, I mean, they've been doing this since, since 2013, for, for crying out loud. Um, but you know you have a lot of moving pieces here, and you have uh, you know you have Tehran thinking about this in a lot of different ways. On okay, well you know how do we how do we push forward? You know how do we get something done? And for them, I mean, I wrote an article for Foreign Policy. This is like in I say it was like either 2015 or 2017. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but I talked about, you know, it was actually, it was when, uh, it was when, uh, uh Jihad Mughni, uh, Imad Mughni is, uh, and if you remember Imad Mughni, of course you remember who he is, uh, but for, uh, oh, yeah. for the listeners, Imad Mughni, uh, actually one of his most major bombings was the anniversary for it was yesterday, uh, that was done in 1983, um, but Imad Mughni was kind of the terrorist extraordinaire for Lebanese Hezbollah and their Islamic Jihad section. Um, and uh, before Bin Laden. Yeah, before Bin Laden. He was he was on. He, he was the guy. He was the guy. Um, and so anyway, his son, who was a was a Lebanese Hezbollah member, was actually out there in the Golan scouting around and the uh, the Israelis killed him along with some other leading commanders, possibly even an IRGC commander, uh, and a lot of other Hezbollah commanders were there. So anyway, just kind of <laughs> that little side there. Um, you know, this is kind of what you're you're dealing with. So it's anyway, it was around that period. And what I kept noticing was, and it wasn't just the Israelis, but the way the, the Iranians were constructing a kind of regional, I would almost call it like a, 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 a almost like the Islamic resistance version of regional containment, um, where what they would do is they would form these kind of circles, these, these, these circles around their foes. So for instance, for Saudi Arabia, if you look at the Saudis um, on their southern, uh, on the, on the south, uh, southern section, uh, you have Yemen and you have Ansar Allah, aka the Houthis, uh, who made some, some extraordinary advances there. In Bahrain, you had a series of uh, front groups and other smaller organizations that the Iranians were not only propping up, but giving a lot of training and advice to, uh, and they were causing problems over there. Um, you then had the issues in Syria. You can't ignore that. 
and you can't negate it. You also have the issues in Iraq, so you have that. So, I mean, you look at this arc, there's now, Sa the Saudis are surrounded on that end. If you look at the Israelis, the Gaza Strip provided uh, the Iranians with quite a good place to kind of base uh, I mean, a lot of attacks, a lot of other uh, moves off of. So you have that, that forms another little pressure point on the Israelis in the southern flank. And then you also have northern flank, Lebanon and and potentially Golan Heights. Um, but anyway, th that was essentially the gist of what I was, I was writing then. And you're seeing, you know, you're seeing that strategy, at least some form of it kind of coming into fruition. So you've said to me, previously, and I think you were tweeting some stuff along these lines last night, that uh, what you're seeing right now spooks you quite a bit. And I know the question of will Hezbollah get involved um, more directly in this war is still kind of an open question. Uh, we have two carrier strike groups in the Eastern Mediterranean right now, supposedly to, to deter them from doing so. Um, so do, do you think Hezbollah will get involved? And what are you seeing right now that that concerns you so much. So what's going on right now, there are certain patterns that are falling into place that, you know, I've been watching this long enough uh, to be able to not only discern the patterns, but I mean, I've written about them. Uh, in 2015, I actually wrote about recruitment patterns that were going on for Syria and Iraq. And I mean, I'm seeing that on one end where the recruitment patterns for a major conflict or, or something else that they're trying to do, that's one step. The second step on this is kind of narrative construction and kind of the construction of a general understanding of, of what this conflict is. And that's being built up as well. Um, there's also a mixed messaging strategy, which generally comes uh, before Iran tends to act, uh, that they have been doing both to kind of Western press, but then also to, uh, you know, within their own Persian language and also Arabic language presses. Um, there's different kind of forms of communication going on now, particularly within Iraqi Shia militias and what messages they are sending out. And I mean, part of it is this, this is, this is what bothers me about it. Um, you know, if I were looking at this before, I mean, there's maybe been one instance when every single model was being followed, or at least like one major piece of that model was being followed, um, and that it, it resulted in like nothing. Um, and I mean, that could have just mm -hmm. been like a, a test uh, just to see how far they could go and what they, they wanted to see, like they wanted to see how it would all work out. Um, but every other time we have seen mobiliza mass mobilization for fighting in Iraq, mass mobilization for fighting in Syria. Uh, we've seen the the adoption of a lot of different new forces, a lot of different populations they can recruit from. Um, they have kind of played all that up. Uh, even saw it in Bahrain to a certain extent, where it followed a lot of these these other models. And all of those are now starting to to roll. And whenever I see that again, it gives me pause. Um, now I I don't want want everyone to think that oh well that just means war is coming. You know there, there's already war here. And by the way, just to kind of. Uh, address what you said, you know, for Lebanese Hezbollah. I mean, Lebanese, Lebanese Hezbollah is already involved. We have to remember that Lebanese Hezbollah is also playing with the Israelis in terms of a, a brinksmanship level. And what scares me about a lot of this is um, I feel like the genie has been released out of the bottle um, where it's just going to keep escalating, escalating, escalating because one side can't necessarily back down. And when I say that, I mean, I, I'm taking this from the Iranian level. Um, you know, they have tried to establish new red lines and they have established them with what happened with Hamas and Gaza. Um, they have done that. I mean, this is a totally different world from where it was even five, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, it is completely different in terms of how the Israelis are reacting, what pressure can be put on them from, you know, even from international actors, uh, but particularly from Iran and where they are placed. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's a, another very, very important concern to kind of keep in mind. But when you start to see kind of the, the calls for mass mobilization, uh, when you start to see very specific groups that have been involved in a lot of very direct, kind of directly controlled Iranian activities in the region, um, and these are guys that, you know, really have had the ball rolling the entire time, and they are loyal, and they're effective at what they're doing. Um, and they're also very effective at executing, uh, whether it's, you know, messaging policy or actually military strategy for Iran, when they start kind of turning on the spigot, and that's again, what I'm, what I'm starting to see, then it really does give you pause for a second. I mean, there are other pieces to this as well. 
Um, I think it's important to remember, you know, it, it, I was talking to another colleague about this and, and he was, you know, we were kind of half joking about it. You know, we all know that the Israelis are going to hit, you know, they, they've already hit, you know, all the airports in, in Syria and uh, over his, uh, kind of historically, that's how they flew in a lot of these recruits and whatnot. You know, they just kind of get them in. And then, you know, I paused for a second because, yeah. you know, we're thinking about, oh, well, they're going to recruit these guys and they're just going to churn them out and throw them onto the battlefield. Well, that's not how that works at all. Um, I mean, even in Syria, when they had uh, not enough guys to go around and they were just, you know, literally pulling people out of prison sometimes and then giving them two weeks training. They still had two weeks training. There was still, you know, an element of kind of control and managed structure that was there. Um, and that kind of giving me pause to that. In Syria, you're having upwards of, you know, you're having over 10,000, over 15,000 Shia militiamen who are still in the country. What do you do when you have to redirect those guys, right? You know, you think about that. Well, you can redirect them. That's part of it. So you can redirect another couple thousand within the country down to bordering areas. Sometimes you don't necessarily need 5,000 uh, to do the job of a few rocket squads and, and the jobs of a few specialized units that can kind of use new areas and traverse different ground. Um, I think a lot of people do tend to forget that. Um, but you know, with, with whatever's going to happen, you know, I always tend to think, you know, okay, well, now that these forces have been moved out of certain other areas that they're needed in, you know, who safeguards that? Well, and you have the idea of, well, I guess that's what, what the new recruits are going to be doing, protecting, you know, protecting the, uh, the lines uh, behind the scenes. Um, but I mean, when it kind of starts to spell out in that way, um, again, this is kind of, I, I keep saying this, it gives me pause because the thinking process is there for the Iranians and they are, I mean, they may very well be executing, you know, kind of a, a larger plan. Where do you think this goes? Where do I think this goes? If it gets worse, then we have an even larger major regional conflagration. Um, and that would be a full kind of involvement of uh, Iraqi, uh, tons of different Shia militia groups, but we're talking elements that are comprised of Afghan Shia, Pakistani Shia. Um, we have a ton of Iraqis, we have Lebanese Hezbollah, we have Syrian Hezbollah style groups. Um, I mean, that that's a huge thing. The other thing is the Israelis have already threatened before that in the next war with Lebanon, they're essentially going to turn the place into glass. Um, and I can't imagine that with everything going on in Gaza uh, and everything else going on where, where they are feeling the pressure of uh a, a, a very existential kind of threat, even though they they can deal with it, but then it's the okay, what's the second order to this, and how do we how do we how, are we going to just deal with it more after we've smashed this, and and you know what are we going to do, um, particularly after you've had thirteen hundred you know of your own civilians as, as civilians and other forces uh, massacred, um, I I mean I I I do wonder what that kind of that what that'll lead to. Um, but you know, there's another take to this as well. It's also not as good, um, and that not as good one is okay. We still have this kind of series of brinksmanship that's going on between Lebanese Hezbollah, maybe even some other different militia groups will kind of you know kind of open things up and cause an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it stays like that. But you may have you know a lot of damage in southern Lebanon and 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 in, possibly in Syria and in northern Israel, uh, in addition to everything else that's going on in Gaza. Um, I mean, I I think no matter how you're kind of really getting out of this, um, you, you, you're just going to have a lot of death and destruction. But my issue with it is, you know, it's it's how, how much and how far are different parties willing to escalate? And for the Israelis, I think looking at how the Iranians have constructed this, they're willing to escalate because they are, their argument would be, we have to nip this in the bud. We never did it in 2006. We didn't do it at other opportunities that might have been more beneficial. Um, you know, we are you know trying to work with other international partners and kind of make this so you know things don't really spill over. Um, but again, I mean, it's it's really up to two players in the room. It's Iran and it's the Israelis. You know, where they really want this to go. Um, and I think for the Iranians, I I do think that they have set some pretty firm red lines. That's the impression I'm getting. Uh, particularly with Gaza, um, mm -hmm. because you know, again, a lot of people have forgotten. Um, they've forgotten the 2006 war, and the 2006 war. You know, even if you're kind of just reading it in a tertiary form, you get like Wikipedia or something. Um, you would think that, well, it's just like this Lebanon thing, and you know, uh, Hezbollah tried to kidnap a bunch of Israeli, you know, Israeli soldiers, and they got some, and then it, it caused this big conflagration. 
Well, what's forgotten is it's actually inherently linked to what was going on in Gaza. Because again, this is that redrawing of the red lines and showing unified fronts, kind of like what this type of operation yeah. was meant to do, at least in, in a Palestinian sense for the Iranians. Um, but that really lit up because it was showing, you know, essentially, you know, showing Hezbollah solidarity with, you know, the Palestinians uh, over the whole Gilad Shalit uh, episode, kidnapping, um, and, you know, th you know, this is how we're going to going to execute it. And they weren't really expecting the Israelis to respond the way they did. But this is what I'm talking about. Like, well, I wasn't expecting this response, but I was totally you know, going to do this. Um, and there's a very, very easy a uh, very quick chance that this could actually result in that. What I'm saying is kind of an escalation where there is a lot of quote unquote catastrophic success in addition to catastrophic failure. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Sure. Uh, Philip, anything else you'd like to cover today that we haven't? Well, I you know I kind of wanted to get into um, what the what these proxy networks are. I want to spell it out because I really did not do a very good job on that, and yeah. and I I think it would be better to do it this way. So. The Islamic, the Islamic Republic of Iran ideologically would really love to push their ideology in, in Arabic called absolute wilayat al -Fulqi. If you could just say for people who who don't know, and I'm guessing that's most, what 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 is that? That's everyone, yeah. <laughs> absolute wilayat al fuqi is, I mean, it's also called vilayat al fuqi in in in, uh, in Persian, mm -hmm. um, but that ideology is essentially what you have in Iran, mm -hmm. meaning there is a supreme leader who's essentially the placeholder for Imam al-Mahdi, um, who, you know, the, the kind of Shia messianic figure that will come back. Um, but all political, social, religious decision-making really does come down to what the supreme leader wants. Uh, and in part with that ruling, I mean, it's, it's a theocratic style of rule. It's, you know, based along what they would call the Islamic revolution. Um, there are a lot of other concepts that are kind of, that, that kind of orbit it. For mm -hmm. instance, like the concept of the Islamic resistance and what quote unquote resistance really means. But Wilayat al faqi is essentially, you think of uh, the supreme leader, uh, Khamenei in Tehran, you know, he is at the end of the day, the be all to end all when it comes to the political, social and you know, religious and military, you know, answers. He is on high to make those decisions. And, you know, again, it's a transnational ideology, uh, meaning, yes, it does rule in Iran, but when you have a ton of other little groups that adhere to it, that, and they also want to push it, and often they, they will run in elections. I mean, Lebanese Hezbollah runs in elections in Lebanon, uh, and they have never negated their belief in that, in that system. But that's, that's one piece of it. So imagine you have groups that are usually ideologically and let's say let's say sect in a sectarian way like they're Shia uh, might be religiously similar and there are a lot of proxies that are like that so for instance in Iraq we have over 50 Shia militias that are there many of them are part of what's called the al hashd al-Shabi which is the popular mobilization forces and this is a group of, of I should say it's a network of different groups that you may remember from the fight against ISIS and kind of a lot of their the stuff that they would do but they had been in existence since even the you know the Islamic Revolution kicked off in 1979, you know, in Iran. Um, so I mean, a lot of these groups have had a very very long time and long term development. So imagine you have all those. Let's just say just in Iraq, you have Lebanese Hezbollah, another classic example of this, built along the same lines as many of those Iraqi groups. Uh, in Syria, you have some newer groups, some of them Shia, a lot of them not. Um, I mean, you even have ostensibly a, you know, a Christian group that call that's it's an Iranian proxy. It's called Qatab Babliun, which is in Iraq. Uh, it's actually staffed mostly by Shia, but it's led by uh, a number of, of Chaldeans, uh, Chaldean Christians. Um, but I mean, you have other groups too. You have Sunni groups. And, you know, when I talk about a proxy network, let's say those groups don't believe in absolute wilayat al faqi Let's say that they are not uh, ideologically loyal in the way where Khamenei can hand them an order and say, hey, I thought I told you to rocket this. Why are you not doing it? Um, and by the way, just because there's an ideological connection doesn't necessitate that they always do exactly what the Iranians want. You know, that's just how proxies work. Um, but you have groups in, you know, Palestinian territories that are, you know, Marxist in orientation. You have some that are Sunni jihadist. Um, and when I say Sunni jihadists, they don't always have the best relationship with the Shia. Um, but again, Iran is quite pragmatic about this, and they are pragmatic 
for a number of different reasons because you know their end goal is if you are able to cultivate as many links that can be operationalized and kind of you know mobilized in certain ways for your own interests then that is the kind of best end goal now of course would they love all of them to be ideologically completely loyal to them yeah of course they would um you know but you know let's i think they're realistic enough uh to say that having a good uh kind of finger on the button in terms of controlling these guys, uh, not only assists them in their cause, uh, but also they're hoping, I think, for, you know, end effects of, well, you know, once they're loyal, they're loyal, and now they've got to stick with us. And that's actually what we saw in Gaza. And I, I do want I, I do want to say this to, to your listeners on this. Um, in Gaza, don't think that Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad did not have issues with the Iranians. Now, when I say Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is another one of the groups there, this is one of the most loyal groups to the Iranians in the Palestinian sphere since its, its, since its beginning. Um, uh, Eric Scar actually writes a, a great book on them. It's overpriced, in my opinion, because all great, excellent academic books are always overpriced. Of course. But <laughs> not because it's the, the quality or content. Yeah. Um, but he has a great book on it and, you know, you can kind of track their thinking on this. But when I say they've had their issues, the Syrian war that I had brought up earlier was engineered as a Shiite jihad. And when that happens, well, Gaza is vast majority Sunni, <laughs> like leaps and bounds, vast majority Sunni. Um, and you also had Hamas whose roots are with the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood has had some very close, uh, connections with, uh, Iran, um, but in addition to that, they also had groups that were fighting Bashar al-Assad, you know, Iran's key Arab ally in the region. Um, so you had a lot of issues from 2013 on. And what did the Iranians do? Well, if you're not going to listen to us, we're going to pull some funding from you. If you're not going to, if you're going to continue to not listen to us, we're going to start another proxy that will, you know, it might even be formed out of your ranks just to put pressure on you. And don't think this is just because they're just doing this to the Palestinians. They've done this with Shia militias too. Um, Actually, you know, one of the commanders of one of those groups, and he has no, he, he's no longer online anymore, and he no longer talks about his, his political career, but, you know, they worked it there like that too. Yeah. Would Iran sit aside and let Hamas be annihilated in Gaza? I, I don't think they'd want to mm -hmm. because it's a very, very powerful, uh, very powerful proxy for them to use. However, if they're getting punished the way that they are, it begs the question, okay, then what's the proper Iranian response to demonstrate, you know, some level of deterrence from them being destroyed? And right. the Israelis are quite clear that they're going to, you know, smash them into the sand. Um, so, I mean, I... you have to think of it this way. Okay, then what's that red line? And this is what scares me about what I'm seeing going on in a lot of the Shia militia circles, where is the, is the red line the advance into Gaza? Is the red line some other target that's hit? Is it a combination of a lot of different things that I just, you know, we can't see yet? Right. Um, but Iran has to kind of draw that line because, again, they've boxed themselves in in a certain way where, you know, if you're going to be the leader of, this, of the Islamic resistance, of the resistance against Israel, against the United States, and you just allow... You know, you know, on a big screen TV, your one of your major proxies that you are very openly supporting to not just wither on the vine. I mean, they, they've allowed that for groups that they no longer need it anymore. They just let them wither, and you know, who cares? You know, whatever happens, we we have a better deal with another group. This is not that case. Um, this is this is very very different. I mean, this is an Israeli advance that could amount to you know Hamas being relatively well removed from Gaza. Um, and I don't, <laughs> again, that's, you know, neither here nor there. Um, but, you know, the Iranians can't just sit back and just take it because guess what? That's, that's then another hit in their faces. That's how they're going to recognize it. Now, the Iranians though will do this and, 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 you know, I have to be, I, I'm trying to be as cautious as I can in terms of how I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. There's a concept that they always bring out, it's sabr. And they love it because, you know, it comes from the Quran um, and it's patience. And you'll often hear this when they can no longer really, you know, they can't execute the attack. They can't really do this. They can't really support this group. No, no, no. Just be the sabreen and be the patient ones. And, you know, they have a line like that. Uh, and they even pulled that in Bahrain when they could, you know, no really, no longer really, you know, keep up the efforts there uh, because their internal security was getting very good. And, you know, the Iranians were under a lot of pressure uh, because of it. Um 
But I look at this and, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, if you, you can't really throw this away to, oh, just, you know, we just need to throw some Sabater in there. There's just, just a little patience, guys. Don't worry. We're going to we're going to get back to liberating Palestine in a second after we've just lost, you know, five, four or five major proxies that we've been building up for the past, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't really make sense. But again, you know, it, it comes down to the Iranians also saying to themselves, is it, you know, is this really going to be worth it? You know, how do we balance those stakes here? And again, this is where I say it puts everybody in a very, very complicated position. Uh, Iranians, Israelis, even American policymakers on kind of what comes next and, you know, how it's going to go. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, you are, I know, absolutely slammed these days and have been very generous with your time. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, but before we wrap, just want to say as a, on a personal point, I mean, just speaking as a friend here, some of the stuff that you get exposed to in, in following this topic and in researching these groups, I mean, is stuff that no human being should ever have to see. And I just hope that you are taking time to take care for yourself, to take breaks, to, to rest. Um, as this goes on, just please do that. Oh, that's very kind of you and i will say there is no rest for the wicked um <laughs> but you know it you know i i i do kind of want to say this you know i i am a firm believer if you are a researcher and you are committed in a passionate and and like an a truly intellectual kind of as an intellectual fascination this kind of stuff is going to cross your desk you're going to see it and by the way you're going to see more and more and more of it um, I mean, the trend lines were already there. Yeah. And again, I mean, I, I, I am a piker compared to people who uh, do this far more intensely, uh, meaning, you know, people who are in, you know, U.S. government circles, different government circles, you know, this is their life. Unfortunately, I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of living a parallel existence doing my own, my own research. But, you know, I, I, <laughs> I would say for people who are researching, you you know, when you come across this stuff, it is not the easiest. And you may think, you know, I've been doing this since my 20s, and I even said this to you, um, it doesn't come off quite the same uh, when you're younger and it's kind of, you know, you know pissing vinegar kind of, kind yeah. of thing. Um, it, it hits very differently, especially when, you know, technology has advanced so much, uh, even in, you know, a very small time frame. And... Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, I would hope that some people are ready for it, but I, you know, ready for it if they're actually pursuing that. But then the bigger problem that I have is it's become so normalized now that you're seeing younger and younger people who are just like, oh, you're, you're feeling bad about that. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, whoa. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm a full believer in if you're going to pursue something, then you do it to your utmost and you try to get every little angle of it and you have to understand all these pieces to kind of understand a bigger picture. And unfortunately, you're going to see a lot of other bad stuff along the way. And, and you know, I'll tell you something. Um, there were advances that were happening. I'll give you a good example of this for like kind of the ultra violence when I, you know, I would have said the last time I saw stuff even approaching this level in kind of Iran proxy world um, would have been during the Iraq war. And I'm not talking about the Islamic State stuff. This is, you know, this is separate from, yeah. from that. But it was during the advances towards uh, Fallujah, Tikrit, um, a lot of the, the Hashd al-Shabi, those, those Iraqi Shia factions, um, were putting up stuff that was quite brutal. Now, they had been putting stuff up since Syria, but they were doing it in an organized way to send the signal that they were going to smash the living hell out of a lot of different cities. And they wanted the populace there to know that they were going to shell the living hell out of it and anyone that they caught who they claimed was ISIS uh, or, you know, anything else that they didn't like uh, was going to not have a good time. Uh, we're talking beheadings. We're talking people hung up on, I always mentioned the hung up on electricity pylons. That was a favorite of theirs where they'd light them on fire and, and do that. Yeah. Um, we even had a guy named Abu Azrael. Uh, that was his, his nom de guerre. Um, who was with a group called Kitab al-Imam Ali, um, and everybody called him Iraqi Rambo. Well, Iraqi Rambo claimed, I mean, they claimed it was, um, you know, an ISIS guy that they were roasting over a pit, and then he took a sword and cut a piece off and said, hey, you know, this is, uh, it's, a, it's like a shish, you know, it's uh, it's, it's cooking like meat. Um, but what I, what I would say, going with that, 
uh, <laughs> as, as I shift slightly, um, going with that, if I were not watching that and seeing it, um, it would not have pointed to very specific trend lines that were for what the group was doing. When the ultraviolence started to come out and little videos like that started to come out, then you knew something else was working up. Why would that be out on this medium? Why would that be shared internally here but not there? Why is this kind of messaging acceptable right now? Oh, oh, okay, it makes sense. The advance is not only coming, um, but they think they can get away with this stuff. Great, okay, I, I know that now. And again, it sounds really kind of cold um, in terms of how that's kind of done, but again, that's that's it's it is part of the puzzle in terms of understanding groups and individuals that are incredibly opaque. Is that why you think Hamas resorted to these tactics this time? Is it that just shock? We're going to come over the fence and we're just going to erase you from existence in the most brutal way possible? That psychological warfare? Yeah. Oh, of course. No, I mean, look at the psychological warfare they're, they're doing right now. I mean, you're having you know a young woman who was uh, who was kidnapped uh, near Stolot, um, and you know she's out there saying, "Oh, they're and they're taking great care of me." It's like that little drip, drip, drip of stuff. I mean, you had Hamas yeah. members. At least reportedly, you know, this is what they were doing. Um, they were, you know, putting stuff on on live streams and on Facebook pages, you know, that because they had grabbed somebody's telephone mm -hmm. and they were, you know, putting that stuff up and people were able to see that. Just to clarify here, they were Hamas were taking people captive, taking their phones and uploading live streaming these acts on the social media accounts of the people that they were torturing. So there are a number of reports from family members who were seeing things like this. And by the way, this would not be you know the first time. It's, it's not the first time that stuff like that has actually happened, mm -hmm. where uh, things have been uploaded onto different forms of social media and then sent to, or they're watching it, you know, watching it happen on the feed. Um, but you know, apparently that Hamas members were doing that. Now, again, I mean, you, the argument is, I mean, Hamas was deliberately targeting civilians. They were targeting them to take them hostage. They were targeting them to kill them. Um, you know, in terms of propaganda messaging, you know, they were taking videos of this stuff as it was going on. Um, so, you know, it, it, it comes down to, okay, well, was this, you know, individual fighters who are taunting people and they think it's it's a clever move? Maybe. I mean, that did happen with Shia militias in Syria. They loved putting stuff up like that. They love doing that to taunt people. Um, but it's interesting when it becomes kind of, again, this homogenized form and method to taunt your enemy. And frankly, I mean, I think it, it's already kind of gone into that into that sphere. I mean, it's interesting. There's like a level of cognitive dissonance here where Hamas will simultaneously say, and they have said this more than once, we didn't go in and, and target any civilians. No, that wasn't deliberate. We didn't give those orders. And, you know, we're going to, you know, we have a lot of discipline in our ranks and we were going after the military. Yeah, they, they said this. They said this. I mean, um, uh, one of their spokesmen had actually come out. This is sometime uh, a few days ago. I, I, mean, I was about to say some time ago. I feel like I've lived a couple of years within a week. Yeah, it feels um, like it. But it, it, it's a lot. But um, he had come out and said Hamas takes pains to not target civilians. This is the same group that was, you know, blowing up Egged buses in, in Israel and, yeah. uh, you know, was also targeting, targeting, targeting Bedouin civilians in Gaza. I mean, again, nobody cared about that when that was happening. Um, but, you know, doing the same thing, they didn't care. These people were civilians, you know, you're ripping people out of cars and, and, and executing them. It was just like, again, it's that cognitive dissonance of it where they're simultaneously also doing the other brutality. And I have noticed it for quite some time with a lot of, of, of Middle Eastern, just militias, terrorist groups, uh, this kind of stuff they will do. Um, and you know, I, it, it's, <laughs> To call it intriguing would be the wrong word to use, mm -hmm. um, because I just think, I think for for people who are happily sedentary living here, it is so incredibly shocking that you know a, a you know a group and its members could kind of pull something off like that. That it it kind of uh, it, it creates some level of disbelief, um, and I again, it wouldn't shock me. Would not shock me one bit 
if part of the thinking behind a lot of this is, you know, well, we're being slammed in the face with all of this content, all of this stuff, all this just really horrific stuff, while you're also getting a totally different, you're getting a different kind of activist message from one end in the West, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Um, you're getting a different series of political messages. You're getting ultra violence. You're getting this. You're getting that. Um, I, I mean, it's it's almost deliberately structured to have some level of overload. And you know, I think the brutality behind this was to show the Israelis um, with you know their their you know kind of fancy weapons and and you know living in a very very first world state with magical fences with a lot of electronics on it that hey. Not only did we get through it, but we brutalized you down to the core. It's it, it reminds me of what Syed Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the the Secretary General of Lebanese Hezbollah, said. This was after two thousand six. You know, he said that Israel was the you know a spider's web. It was a weak kind of web, um, and this is like this regular motif that was used by them, and they still use it in their propaganda. Um, but to prove that, how do you do it? Well, what did they just do? They just advanced. You know how many kilometers into into Israel proper took out kibbutzim, took out you know different farms, um, you know killed, pulled people away. Uh, you know we're executing them at a at a uh, at a outdoor festival. Um, you had paragliders who were going in 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 mass, you know, and doing this. And it was a multi front campaign that was launched from Gaza. You you probably could not get a better example of you know, kind of penetrating that spider's web in in the kind of propagandistic sense. Yeah, I think that's a great point to to leave things on for for today. Um, if listeners would like to follow your your work, your commentary on this as it on this war as it progresses, um, where can where can folks find you? Uh, so I'm I. I have a lot of stuff published in a lot of places, um, but Twitter is usually a better place to find me, even though I was off Twitter for quite some time. Um, but I'm at Philip Smythe, so it's Philip uh, with two L's, and Smythe is S-M-Y-T-H. I, by the way, I just realized that Mrs. Doubtfire, there's a line in there where um, uh, uh, Robin Williams goes, you know, it's it's Smythe, not Smith here. <laughs> 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 I keep thinking about that now. Like, how did I not realize this? I could have been using that line the whole time. So even though my name is Smythe, you know, when when we usurp that name from the Irish, um, we did not take, we did not slap an E on top of it. Uh, it's still Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H. Um, I, well, I'm gonna, I've got plenty of Irish in me and English and everything else. I'm a mutt. Yeah, <laughs> me too. The, the, the joke being, the joke being is somehow my name is so messed up that people can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, it's Philip two L's S M Y T H. That's kind of what I'm at on Twitter. You'll see different articles and stuff that I'm writing. Um, I have a bunch of different things that I had set up over the years, uh, but it's kind of like taking a dive down, you know, memory lane. Um, when I worked at the Washington Institute, uh, I've have the bio page there of a lot of the stuff that I've written. Um, I've written a lot of things for CTC Sentinel, which is West Point's uh, publication. Um, working on a few other different articles. I mean, but you, know, I, I, you type in type it into Google, yeah. you'll find stuff. I'll, I'll, you know? We'll we'll have uh, links to your to your Twitter and some of those uh, you know bigger places where you published all all your articles over the years. That if, if folks want to look into that, but no, I think if um, if if people are are kind of curious about this region and 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 how it works and the actors involved and you know i mean someone with with eyes on the ground that are kind of second to none um i think you're one of the one of the best people to listen to as this as this unfolds philip thank you for coming on thank you so much for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. Thank you.